Good afternoon. Hopefully you can hear me in the in the back rows because I cannot rely on audio uh, today, and hopefully people on the on the stream can hear me as well. So uh, my name is Ludek Schmidt, and uh, you know I have a day job, and then I am tinker with house. So uh, I was thinking about you know let's give some presentation which is a crash course, basically an overview of you know what you can do with whole automation how. Uh, in the open source world, because you know I like the open source quite a lot. So it will be a little bit about home automation, like two slides, and then a lot about home assistant, because that's my preferred solution. So uh, first of all, all wall of text. So what is home automation? You know, it's basically building automation applied to your home. So uh, you know, it's actually a system that monitors parameters of your a home, you know, and then controls uh, some of the some of the appliances you you have at, at home, like lights. Uh, it could be blinds, you know, things like that. So we're basically trying to put computer into position of managing some of the tedious tasks, like venting the rooms, which is not that tedious if you want to survive. So uh, there is some quotation of what it is. There's like more text about what it is, but. Uh, like usually picture is worth a thousand words, so this could be home automation. <laughs> this is actually uh, from Reddit. Someone was de depicting their home automation. Why I chosen this picture is, this is all closed source solutions. Like that's why you see three hubs in the middle. You know, you see tons of devices attached to those, some really weird things flowing, you know, uh, forward and backward and you know passing data and then I see like a hundred different ways how this can fail. Uh, and now marketing slide. This is open source home automation. <laughs> of course oversimplified a little bit but still uh, the idea here is you have central hub home assistant that can integrate with tons of other stuff. So that's that's why I really really like the open source solution because you know, whenever I look at the closed source one, uh, it was usually lacking something. An integration, you know, I wanted, or you know, when I wanted to fix something, there was no chance to to you know get it fixed because of the vendor wasn't responsive, all of that. So that's why I like the home uh, home assistant. That's why I like open source. And uh, this, if I had this talk five years ago, that's when I started. Home Assistant was bare bone. You needed you needed really some skills to play with it. To you know even you know run the the Z, uh, Z Wave stick, you know it was a chore. I still enjoyed it. Uh, today it's much more mature solution. But before going there, there was actually an announcement a couple of uh, months ago about home, Open Home Foundation. And what I like about Hope Open Home Foundation is that they have a very clear principles about what they want to achieve. So that's why it's on the slide. Uh, the first one is paramount to me and maybe to a lot of people in this room, I would assume, and it's privacy. Because when I work with Google, what I'm doing, I'm giving all, the, all my data into the, into the cloud. So when I attach a, a motion sensor in my hall, hallway, Guess what it does? It, it do it does like it very very often sends the data to the cloud and then controls something different in my house. So I'm giving away the data. If my internet breaks, which is a question on when, not if, then I'm without that functionality. The other thing is, uh, like vendors try to lock you down. So I like the choice, and I like it a lot. It means I can. Because I'm a technician, I can play with different things. Uh, you know, my, my house looks pretty weird on that on that front because of I play with different things. Uh, but I can mix mix and match devices. I can like pick this one because it's the best in the class for lightning. There's like another for venting. There can be valve I like from another vendor, and I can integrate them together. And the uh, sustainability is the other part uh, thing. You know, you lose warranty when you flash a device. Uh, but you know you can actually repurpose the device or flash open source uh, firmware into an existing hardware. I like that a lot as someone who like plays with things, and I assume some people in this room would actually like the, like the same thing. Uh, 
what Open Home Foundation is on the technical side is it's basically an umbrella to a lot of projects that are touching home automation. So first of all, Home Assistant, which is a hub, like there's a very, very important piece of software. Uh, the other is ESP Home, which allows you to build your own devices from mi microcontrollers, some other pieces, and then program them and connect them to your ecosystem. And then there are others. I, I named the uh, Zigbee stack, uh, Z-Wave stack. There's like you know over 200 libraries that uh, are part of this uh, foundation, and uh, you know they all follow the basic the, all the principles of privacy, you know choice and sustainability. So it like, creates the whole ecosystem of uh, software you can use. So with that, I take a breath. Uh, and I'll start talking about Home Assistant a little bit. So what it is, you can read it behind me or on the screen. Uh, on the more pragmatic side, it's a very stable platform. You know, if you want to play with some whole automation and just, uh, uh, you know, see what it can do for you, I would go for this as a first choice because of its stable, you know, it's, it has a huge ecosystem. You know, the 200, uh, sorry, 2,800 integrations that are officially supported integration that work out of the box. There are many more uh, if, you, if you need to reach out. So that's a really, really good because of the moment you kick, uh, kick on Home Assistant in your home, it sniffs your network and you can be surprised what it finds. Because like suddenly your TV pops up and you can like turn it on and off through the Home Assistant. And then, you know, maybe you have a, you know, Google Home or something that pops up as well. You know, Sonos devices, like they, they are just discovered. So like, if you're a technician and you play with these things, you probably have a home full of these things that could be already integrated with the system. Uh, the other piece is that uh, is important for me. There's a program that that's called Works with Home Assistant, either locally or via cloud, via Zigbee, via Z-Wave, etc. And that's an official, official certification that something works out of the box with Home Assistant. So uh, if it has the logo, you can be pretty sure it's, it's painless integration. The community is awesome, literally. Like, you know, submitting patches is, a, is nice. Uh, there is like a very lively forum. Uh, you can you know, find a lot of solutions already, people are responding, etc. So that, that's really, really nice too, if you're starting or if you get into some really big troubles. And uh, the whole uh, foundation also sponsors some hardware development. This is for people who do not know how to get a Raspberry Pi, how to flash a card, how to kick it on. So you can basically buy a box that has everything pre-installed, connected, it has all the radios and everything, and start playing with that. Of course, it's at the beginning, so uh, you know it still needs some knowledge. But you know, I think it's a very good start. Uh, like when when you think of Linux uh, as a, as an open source project, it's it tries because of the uh, the huge ecosystem, and this really feels similar. And you know, there are other pieces of hardware, like you know, there's, for example, like Blue Stick that's good for the Z uh, Zigbee radios. So like they they try to make sure that you can get some quality devices with a long-term support uh, that can be pretty easily integrated. So again, a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is how the UI looks like. This is actually uh, one of my ro uh, my rooms. So what you can see is thermostat. You can see some light. You can see some graph that shows when the heating was on and off compared to the to the you know temperature in the room and outside, uh, etc. Uh, you know you can see even the the vacuum uh, robotic vacuum uh, device that you know is currently docked or was when I took the screenshot. I'm not sure what the, what it does right now. And uh, you know there's much more. Uh, in the in the system, so the uh, the screenshot from the left is actually uh, application for the smartphones. So there's application for both Android and iOS that you can connect to the to to your instead of instance of Home Assistant. Actually, you have you know all the screens, all the dashboards on your phone, which is pretty handy uh, because it allows you to you know not to reach out to the browser, etc. Uh, and 
If you want to play playably Big Brother, of course the phone can also be connected uh, to the home assistant and send the data. If you are at home, if your battery is charging, like there's like you know, about 60 sensors that uh, can be monitored. I don't like it personally because I don't want to be watched by a machine, uh, but still there is that option. So that was about the home assistant as a hub. It couldn't be successful if there is not a way how to integrate it with something in your home. And that's where this system really shines. What I mean by that is I'll go through a couple of slides of what you can actually look at, sources of integrations of plugins, etc., that you can pull in into the system and start playing with. The reason why I'm doing this is just for us to realize that there's a community around it. Uh, if you have a problem with a 99% chance, there is a solution already, so you don't have to code it yourself. And there's like you know, multiple levels of risks you can take when incorporating a third party code. So first one I already mentioned, those are officially supported integra integrations. What it means is before a new release of Home Assistant, all those integrations are tested. That means they work, or work out, of, out of the box. You know, part of the release notes, you can see which are new, which are be going to be obsoleted, what are the breaking changes. There's a very good documentation for those. So it's a pretty safe bet for if I use it, it will be there for some time. It will probably not break. It's still open source. And uh, if it breaks, someone will look at it and probably fix it. And there's like a lot of them from different areas. So I know it's, I don't want to go through all, all of them. Uh, the other thing uh, that you can actually uh, integrate into the system are called add-ons. Think about add-ons as containers with a third party code. So because it's container, it's isolated from the rest of the system. So it cannot do any harm directly to the running home assistant instance. Uh, but uh, you know, they are usually used to package some other software. Uh, there are over 20 official add-ons like MQTT servers and uh, some SSH terminals. So like, you know, some basic stuff, editor to edit your configuration files if you need to, things like that. Uh, they are maintained by the home assistant uh, community directly. And then there are, like, you can find GitHub repositories with other, uh, other uh, software like Plex, Jellyfin, you know, you name it, you can probably find it. It's basically a software packaged in a way that you can upload it to your uh, server running home assistant and just use the computing power to run other services. Sometimes it's connected to the home assistant itself. Sometimes it's not so well integrated. Uh, but you know, it's a very nice way how to use the hardware you have at home and run a couple of co more containers on it and uh, you know, use, get more functionality out of that. Of course, if you go outside of the official add-ons, your risk increases. Because you know, you're basically downloading you know, unverified, untested insta container instances on your system. But hopefully, because of how the whole the server is set up, I'll run into the details a little bit la later. You know, that container is still pretty well isolated from the rest of the system. And uh, you can decide how much you trust the container. So this is still a relatively safe bet. If you want to, s to live a more dangerous life, uh, there is uh, basically a repository called Home Assistant Community Store. That means anybody can add something to that community store. The tricky thing is this is code that's imported into your Home Assistant instance. If it breaks, it breaks. There's no guarantee around it. There's a lot of very nice things uh, you can find in, in it, but it's risky. Uh, I have to use it because of, you know, I, I like some device which is only supported through this. So, uh, and I have pretty good uh, experience with it, but things like virtual thermostats, like software driven uh, thermost defined thermostats that like, you know, using some other components in the house to work as a thermostat, but there's no real thermostat in the wall. Uh, it broke on me a couple of times in the winter, so it was fine. Uh, not fine, it was, uh, it was fun. So um, 
uh, that's a danger of you know letting the computer run your house right things break <laughs> uh, and then if you want to live even more dangerous life you can build your own hardware and uh, this is the, another project it's called ESP home it's basically a repository of supported hardware components it could be some microcontrollers uh, like ESP32 for example which is pretty pretty common these days you know some sensors some LED displays uh, like this ab about 50 60 components which when you wire them correctly and you don't burn anything uh, you can like flash it with the special firmware and then you use YAML configuration files to actually describe what you want with it but a lot of heavy lifting was is done in the background like it automatically connects to your to your instance it automatically syncs the data so like when you say okay uh, I have on these two pins I have a temperature sensor and it's named this and that you upload it you don't screw up anything uh, and voila like in your instance you suddenly see the sensor and it updates of course it's fun to build it it's not so fun to fix it if something breaks and uh, you know if it breaks in a way that you cannot uh, you, you cannot fix it you have to rebuild it which like it's dangerous because it, it tends to to break at the times when you don't have time to rebuild it and you miss the functionality on the other hand it's a way how to supply or create things that are not on the market uh, one example is for example uh, is uh, like reading state of the of the power meter for the house you cannot buy you cannot buy the device off the shelf uh, because like usually in Czech, at least at least in Czech Republic the power meters are not smart at all you cannot connect mo most of the things so but you can find solution here that because of every power meter has a LED that blinks at regular interv uh, inter intervals uh, it counts the blinks and computes the power consumption based on that which is pretty cool <laughs> and that bro broke on me which is luckily wasn't wasn't that bad because it's not critical part of the house so that's the ecosystem right I mean I hope we gave you some idea of you know what you can use and how vast it, it is I run a little bit into the details I assume we have a couple of technicians in the room as well so yes it's all Linux it's Linux and Python basically uh, Linux is an operating system Python is the language which is used for most of the uh, coding uh, on the technical side it uses build root um, to generate the distribution it uses docker to run containers uh, it's I don't want to pronounce it the uh, R I A U C whatever that means it, it's used for over the air updates and USB updates and it has a pretty robust system with rollbacks and everything so you don't have to be scared when updating the instance and it uses app armor uh, at the kernel level to actually you know better isolate the containers and better uh, secure the system uh, on the hardware side uh, it can run on a wide variety of hardware so if you have a Raspberry Pi uh, you are all set you just download an image you flash it on your card uh, by the way don't use the card for a production deployment it will fail eventually uh, about a year or so because <laughs> it does write quite a lot of data on the car you know it keeps the history of all the devices uh, of, you know, of the state changes so like it keeps it for about a year so this, that's a lot of data it writes to the car the card eventually dies so use the drive like a SSD or you know M2 SSD whatever is better for you but use a real a real hardware uh yes but the sync uh, the you know the comment was about that you can sync less often but it's pretty difficult because of uh most of the home assistant uh, internals are even driven so it all depends on how quickly the sensors are sending data ah okay okay uh, how the how the data are synced to the card okay yeah thanks mm -hmm. yeah so setting up the the system properly is can prolong the the lifetime of the of the card thanks for the comment yeah 
yeah, no problem at all. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, t I touched Raspberry Pi. You know, you can use Odroid boards or the, you know, your Rusty X8664. This system doesn't need too much power. Or you can run it virtualized uh, on all the known operating systems. So I don't insult anyone, but if you can read, you probably insult it already. Uh, you can run it on some of the analysis. Or you can run it, you know, without container completely if you want to. Uh, the catch here is, if you go to dedicated hardware and you use the, you know, home assistant operating system, you get a lot of goodies for free. You get updates, you get back backups, uh, you know, you get add-ons, you get all the integration and everything. Uh, if you go virtualized, it gets more difficult because you need to map your hardware, like, you know, your USB sticks for radios, you know, all of that. If you go to container on NAS, uh, you have to update it yourself. It cannot update itself, you know, so you're losing functionality, but, you know, running in virtualized is also a very good way how to at least touch it, if you, if you want to give it a try. There's other part uh, of hardware, because the computer itself is not enough. It needs to talk to something. And that's where the things can get really messy real quick uh, because there's multiple radios that are being used. Wi-Fi is one of them. You know, most of the time you cannot run wires to your devices. Some, some can, right? Uh, because they, when they're building the house, uh, they counted on that before. So like they have wires. Some are unlucky like me uh, where you know, I cannot afford to run wires everywhere. So I have to rely on some wireless connection Wi-Fi is very convenient to start with. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a battery-operated devices, it's not that big win because the battery goes out in months, most of the case, cases. But you know, on the other hand, if you want to buy two devices, some smart bulb and maybe a motion detector and hook it up, that's, you know, you have, chances are you have Wi-Fi at home, it's easy. If you go Zigbee or Z-Wave way, no, count on spending at least 50 bucks on the, on the stick with the radio. It could be cheaper than that, but no, z -way tends to be more expensive. Zigbee is cheaper, like 30 bucks, 20 bucks. Uh, but still, you need to purchase something on top. And these protocols are mesh-based, which means the more devices you have at home, the better it operates, because you know, it relays the, the messages between them. Uh, and the radio is pretty weak. So if you have home assistant in one room and you know the device is two rooms next to it and there is no device in between, the reliability of the connection can lack. So the Wi-Fi is easy to start with. Once you start filling your house, it gets better. And then I uh, mentioned Matter or Thread, uh, which is part of Matter. That's a new protocol you know, uh, announced by a couple of big vendors uh, I believe last year or a year ago. Uh, it's pretty quickly developed, but I wouldn't use it at the moment. There's not enough devices in the market. Uh, even the, the home assistant server for Metro is not certified yet. They are still working on it, so it's a bleeding edge. And if you want to use Thread, you cannot use uh, open source solution at the moment because it doesn't work. So it, it, this is something I would look uh, for the future. But if you want to play with home automation today, uh, you know you will be limited uh, with what you can do. And then the last line on the slide: there's a lot of vendor-specific solutions. It's typically Wi-Fi, but it could be different. So uh, then you know you run into integration hell. And then when the, all those integrations on different different levels of risks came came very handy because chances are someone before you had similar problem and maybe was more capable on, than you or had time to write it down. So you write, write the code and so you can like grab it and, and give it a shot. But experimenting with such devices could be costly. Uh, if you find out it doesn't work, uh, then and now you end up with a, with a pretty expensive device that you cannot integrate. Okay, uh, AI. <laughs> And uh, I called it mandatory AI slide uh, because, uh, and you know, I was looking at uh, how the how the whole home assistant development team is looking at AI. And there's actually a block that's not that old, just a couple of days from 7th of June this year, 
about AI and uh, they did some research, tested a couple of engines and find out that it's not reliable enough that you could talk to your AI driven agent and uh, control the house because it's pretty error prone. And uh, you, you want to be pretty sure that when you control some hardware, for example, I have opening windows. I don't want to have them open in the rain by error. That could be a lot of cleanup in the room. <laughs> so um, that's not a thing at the moment because of those large language models and other approaches are not as good at the moment, despite of what other companies are trying to tell us. On the other hand, uh, they are not by the by day. I mean, the development team is not in the way if you want to try it. Uh, you know, there are uh, APIs you can use to hook them into your chat GPT, you know, etc. to allow you to play with it, but it's discouraged to play with the real stuff, uh, at least at the moment. But, I mean, this is all about how adventurous you feel. I mean, hopefully, like, you know, even if the integrations, that's the same thing. You can be very adventurous and, like, try something bleeding edge, or you can play it safe. And I'm actually getting to the end, leaving some room for the questions. I like this quote a lot. Uh, this is actually a blog from a person that started it all. Like uh, Paulus was writing first versions of Home Assistant years and years ago. And he has a blog, I am, you see the date 2016, uh, where now it's a couple, uh, couple of pages of text. But he really, really depicts how the home automation should work. And what I liked about it is, if it goes away, you miss it. But it's not in your way when you want to do something. So it takes some creative thinking to get there. Uh, on the other hand, things break. Internet connection goes out. Raspberry Pi eventually dies. And you don't want to be in a house that you cannot open your window, you know, uh, light up the room or do whatever you need to do, uh, as, which is part of your routine. So the automation should help, but it shouldn't annoy you. Like the moment, you, if you want to you know, turn on off the bulb and you're trying to search for your cell phone, something is wrong. I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had another, another, another talk a couple of months ago where you know, I was basically talking about, OK, if you like hook, hook your smart, smart bulbs, uh, into the sockets and you teach everybody in your house not to touch the switches because of they are still wired and the moment someone turned them off smart bulb is dumb bulb right uh, you know you achieve that goal everything's perfect and your uh, then some visit comes, and you are back to the start line like everything's switched off so <laughs> so uh, just be careful please and with that uh, I'm done with this part of the presentation and open to any questions. Yeah, go for it. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so the just for the for the people on the stream, if there are any, uh, I cannot check it right now. Uh, the question was about how you write the rules because it's not about hooking your devices and sensors into the system. It's about how to control them in a smart way, and uh, that would be uh, maybe two forty-five minutes talks. So I don't have time for that. Uh, but real quick, uh, there is a very good way how to visually design the rules. Basically, you say what triggers the rule, what are the conditions, and what are the actions. It's not a programming language, it's, uh, and it's evolving very quickly. Five years ago, it was, it was basically you were writing YAML code, like line by line, and just praying that it works. Now, uh, no, there is a visual editor uh, with folding. You can actually see the trace of the rule, you see what went wrong, like which message wasn't delivered. So it, it's much better. But that's an easy approach. You still need to know some coding. But then you can actually write rules into, uh, I believe it's called AppDemon, 
uh, which is basically a Python server that connects to all the messages and you can write the codes in Python. But that's, that's at least for me, not that I cannot code, but it can get very complex very quickly because you're dealing with messages, not with the pro procedural programming. So just, and, and then you, know, you can write your own integration or you, you can write your own add-on, like R Node-RED is another very, very uh, frequently uh, used system which reads uh, home automation, me uh, home uh, assistant messages and can send, send them back and process them via the, the flows. So there are like multiple ways how you can deal with it. Uh, what I can say is uh, I myself have about 50 rules. If they start interacting between each other in a ways I didn't anticipate, troubleshooting is a hell. Because of the like, like there is troubleshooting on one single rule, uh, but when you have multiple of them and figuring out which fired when and you know, what caused what could be tricky. So I'm trying to keep things very simple. So thanks for the question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the question is uh, if there are any LoRa devices. I saw some radios for the ESP home, but I do not know the details. I'm sorry. But I, I saw some radios that you can hook up, but I haven't had have a use for them, so I never, never researched those. Sorry. Okay. Any other question? Go for it. Correct. So the question is if uh, there's a commercial usage of home assistant or something that's outside of the home. I am not aware of anything. And honestly, if you would ask me to maybe run this venue on a home assistant server, uh, I don't think you can get commercial support for it at the moment. So there would be no one to yell at. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't probably take that route at all. Not, not today, unless there is something I can, like, some expert I can call to. Uh, so that's probably the, the best answer I can give you. Good for home, for commercial buildings. I believe there are better supported systems at the moment, which probably are not as good in functionality as Home Assistant, but they are backed by professional support, which counts. So, mm -hmm. one more, yeah? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> automation I am most proud of. It's the, I, I have a couple of uh, roof windows. So I'm most proud of automation that actually change, like operates the windows depending on what's the weather forecast. So if I am expecting uh, a hot day, it actually vents the rooms uh, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. to drop the temperature and then like closes them and puts the blind on them so I don't get the sun. I'm proud of it because two reasons. I did a math model of the room had to throw it away because I did mistakes. So we ended up with a notepad. I want to share the room, yes, no, day, uh, time, etc. And I was using that and then to set it up because I couldn't just set it up uh, by myself. So the, the whole house was participating on figuring out when to shade and when not to shade and when to vent and when not, not to vent. And the other thing is that when I set it up, uh, that year I almost didn't have to run air conditioning because of the overnight cooling was so effective. And uh, so that's probably the best. And uh, the other one I'm really, really proud of is actually lights in the hallways. Because what the members of my family really love is if it's after 10 p.m. and you go to the hallway, the lights go just a little bit. So that you know they are dimmed. And that means like if you go at in 3 a.m. you need to go to bathroom, you, you know you're not blasted uh, with the full light. So it's stupid. But you know that's my recommended automation to start with, actually, because it's very, very uh, effective on persuading the rest of the house that this is cool thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I am out of time. Thanks a lot uh, to to you know fill the room. Thanks a lot for the questions, and I ro hope you enjoy the you know, rest of the conference. <laughs>